In this session, we're in the second half of uh, Lesson 12 that we started in our former session. Uh, we'll complete it now and, and then possibly go in, into our another lesson this evening. But we're looking at uh, the transformation of heart and life. Our previous lessons have led us to the cross we saw what saving faith was, the meeting place between God and man. And now, now that man is saved, what are the provisions uh, that flow from his work on the cross that are available to us? And what we saw this morning is, essentially, he wants us to become like he is. He wants to share his life with us. So we become Christ-like in our character, and so that we can be a blessing and a service uh, to our fellow man, and one that we'll be able to share with them, uh, where, where they too can find the bread of life. Because there's people out there that are starving for spiritual reality, mm -hmm. and God is equipping us and giving us the truth, not just so we can eat it and grow fat, but mm -hmm. so we have something to share with others. So we continue, we left off on our point four. Uh, in point three, we looked at the negative uh, aspects of this transformation, and by that, just by way of reminder, when we said negative, is, is there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> it's simply that things that happen that, that are taken away so that when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, there were certain things that were wiped away from us. And that was the, uh, the habits that we had developed by our, by our free choice. You know, the sin that had so deeply ingrained itself, uh, the bondage, uh, the yoke. Uh, so these things were washed away, cleansed away by, by the blood of Christ. And now we have positive Aspects, In other words, something that is added. This is in addition. You know, once the cleansing takes place, now this is going to come upon us. These positive aspects of the transformation. A, there's words indicating that the Holy Spirit is a gift from Jesus and the Father, which repentant believers are to partake of. He said in John 7, 39, that... When he is glorified, uh, those rivers of living water would, would flow through us, uh, that they would refresh, uh, it would invigorate, it would satisfy the deepest longing of the soul. And so that promise was there. And then we have John 14, 16, the promise of the Father. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he, that he may abide with you forever. Yes, that is the spirit of truth, you know, that will abide for us forever. And so uh, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, where God himself, uh, through the Holy Spirit, comes to reside and make his temple in the heart of man. Acts 5, verse 32 and we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Yes, so the church and the Holy Spirit, those are the two witnesses that God left in, in this world. B, there are five analogies that illustrate the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the believer. Uh, one is the vine and the branches. Beautiful illustration of the vine and the branches in John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, 
ye are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved Amen. you. Continue ye in my love. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's a wonderful analogy that, that helps our minds to understand the Christian life. That Jesus said he's, he's the vine, he's, he's the tree, we're, we're the branches. And so the life comes from the roots, you know, up to the branches. So we are sharing in the life of God. And, and the branches bear the fruit. But the fruit is an expression of the life of the vine. You know, and, and when the life comes up, uh, into our hearts uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, then he says you'll bear much fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's the evidence of being his disciple. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's going to be the love, joy, peace, patience, the fruit of the Spirit mm -hmm. in the life. And he says if a person doesn't abide in him, mm -hmm. you know, if there comes a period of time when he, he turns his back, he said he, he's, they dry up. See, the life ceases to flow. If the, if the union, if the connection is broken, and he, and he said they, they, they're pruned, they're cut off, they're thrown away, they're thrown into the fire and burned. And so, again, a very clear picture that we can picture in our minds something that we're familiar with in, in the, the plant kingdom that, that is the spiritual truth that as believers, we partake of the very life of God. And as his life flows in us, there'll be a manifestation of fruit. Hallelujah. Mm, hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm. See, it's the life of Christ. Mm. It's not gritting our teeth and, you know, mm. you know, trying to live the life in our own effort or strength. Mm. You know, we'll miserably fail. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Christ in you the hope of glory. You know, the power of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. So a wonderful analogy. A second analogy is that of a seal. And that we is in 2 Corinthians 1.22. <clears throat> Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. We've shown this before, but usually when you graduate from some kind of an institution, it has the name of the institution, and then down here it's got your name, mm -hmm. and then over here is the president of the organization, and you know you usually have two signatures or so on your certificate, but then you have the official seal somewhere on the certificate. And the, the seal uh, indicates that this is genuine. Also seals in the, the New Testament, uh, sometimes the, they would wear a signet ring as their seal. And so a, mm -hmm. a wealthy man that would have such a signet ring or his helper, his slave, would go into the market and anything that you would put your seal on, that it signified ownership. You know, that, you know, my master is buying this, you know, and, and it shows ownership. But I think for our purposes, you know, this conveys the idea that it's genuine. If you have the seal of the Holy Spirit, you're a genuine believer. You know, this is not a fake certificate that we, you know, manufactured offline or pulled off of the internet and, and printed up mm -hmm. and embellished on our own because it's got the official seal on it. You can't duplicate that. Usually it's embossed. It's, you know, the paper is, you know, rises up 
under the pressure of the seal and you know you can you can feel it and, and so you know if something's sealed and so it is with God in his kingdom you know if, if someone has the seal of the Holy Spirit in our revelation <laughs> study we saw over and over again the the saints are sealed in their forehead mm -hmm. you know the name of God is in their forehead mm -hmm. that's the seal this is something the Lord showed me several years ago is that you cannot Photoshop character. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You just cannot do it. No. It's impossible. Very good. Uh, another analogy that is used is to anoint. And to anoint is a rising up uh, to a privileged place. So in the Old Testament, they anointed prophets, priests, and kings. In the New Testament, it speaks of the anointing, and, and we are to function in that area as prophets, you know, to bring forth the word of God, uh, priests, in that we intercede uh, for the lost. You know, we bring people to God, um, you know, we intercede on behalf of the lost, bring them to the Lord. And of course, kings, we exercise the authority of the kingdom. Where it said, all authority has been given to me, therefore go, make disciples of all, all the nations. So it refers to the anointing, 1 John 2, verse 20 and 27. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. <clears throat> 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abides in you, and ye not... And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Yes, so there's that promise of the anointing. And even in the Old Testament, it was very symbolic. They would anoint the earlobe, they'd anoint the right thumb, and the big toe on the right foot. Mm -hmm. And that was symbolic that, you know, now that you're anointed, you're going to hear the voice of God. And the thumb is, is you're going to do the work of God. And the foot, you know, you're going to walk in his ways. You're going to walk in holiness because you're now anointed servant of God. And so we are anointed. He says, you have an anointing from the Holy One who will teach you all things, because our ear is anointed, you know, to hear that message from the Lord. The next uh, analogy is the idea of an earnest or a down payment. When you purchase a house, you put in a purchase agreement, you usually put a little bit of money down. You know, that's the promise that there's a whole lot more coming later, but I'm serious about this, and um, you know this. This is the the first fruits, the first part of it. Ephesians one thirteen and fourteen. And whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So again, the, the earnest of our inheritance, uh, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, but there's an inheritance. That means everything that, that belongs to the Father, he makes available to the beneficiaries, the Son. And, and if you're a child of God, you're a son. You're a joint heir with Christ. And so everything that the Father has is available to you. Lord, open our eyes. Yes. Help us to understand. Yes. Yes. The Lord, that there is an inheritance. And it's not just in heaven. Mm -hmm. He makes it available now. And it's made available now because of the death of Jesus Christ. You know, he's the one, that's his last will and testament, the New Testament, that 
this cup is a cup of the New Testament in my blood. Mm -hmm. We went to the cross. Now, we're in the New Testament because the testator died. Mm -hmm. We're the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. And so everything that the father has is available to the children. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord, help us to understand this. Lord, open our eyes uh, to the fullness of our inheritance. Mm -hmm. Because I fear that so many of us are walking around like spiritual paupers. Yes. You know, when the abundance of heaven is available. You probably heard this little story. Uh, the kid in newspaper boy, like you were, Mark, the newspaper boy in, in England in the late 1800s. And he, he kept seeing newspapers that the headlines were talking about America and the gold rushes and everything like that. And after a while, a just a deep desire came up in his heart that I want to go to America. You know, I, I've heard it's a land of opportunity. You know, I've read all these headlines and I just want to go there. And so he made up his mind. That's what he's going to do. So... You know, he sold his newspapers, but then he became a dishwasher and, you know, worked two or three odd jobs, just saved every <laughs> single penny he could. So a year or two later, he had enough, you know, for a ticket, you know, fourth class ticket on the steamer uh, to come to America. He had just enough left over to buy, you know, some, some biscuits and crackers for the journey, you know, to kind of get him... Uh, you know, seven-day journey, get him over here to America. And uh, so he was happy, went on board, and after the third or fourth day, you know, he sees all these porters walking by, just mm. dishes of food, mm. big steaks, you know. <laughs> by then, his cheese and crackers are molding. <laughs> He's getting hungry. And so he, he went, goes to the porter and said, I'll tell you what. He says, uh, if you'll just give me a little bit of, you know, that good food you have on your plate, he said, I'll, I'll wash dishes, I'll peel the potatoes, I'll scrub the floor, whatever whatever you want me to do, I'll, I'll do it, but just give me some of that food. He said, well, did you buy a ticket? Yeah. Well, when you bought the ticket, the food is included. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that illustrates... You know, yeah. so many of us. Oh, that's perfect. You know that we, you know that when he died, it, it's a package deal. <laughs> that all of the benefits are there for us, and yet we live our lives like spiritual paupers. Mm. So many of us, because we we aren't aware of the of the riches of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Mm. That's why I say, Lord, open so our true. eyes. When yeah. he talks about this inheritance, mm -hmm. I, I don't think we have the vaguest idea yeah. of what that is. Mm -hmm. You know, the fullness of it. You know, I believe there have been great men of God that have tapped into that. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've seen their healing power and, mm -hmm. you know, doing great exploits of God because they realize, you know, it's Christ in me. Mm -hmm. You know, I have an inheritance. This is this is mine, and I can ask the Father in Jesus' name, and it's, 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 it's available for us. And so if it truly is an inheritance, how much does God have? You think he has enough for us? <laughs> you think there's enough for our journey? You think there's enough to get us through to the end? Yes. But that's a good analogy, because our minds, you know, we, we can see it you know when we when he used these analogies and when you get four or five of them together you know he's trying to make a statement of what the christian life is all about that it's far beyond uh, you know the fullness of our understanding that it that it's so deep and broad and it's available it makes it available Another analogy he uses is that of marriage. And by the way, the book has, you know, a lot more scripture. We're just looking at one under each category, but there's many more. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 
5 through 7. 15 through 6, 17. 15 through 17. 6. 1 Corinthians. 15 through 17. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? None. Or what part hath he that believes with an infidel? None. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? None. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Beautiful. Hallelujah. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Yes. Mm. Was was that First Corinthians six fifteen through seventeen? Yes. Mine says, "Do you not know that your bodies are are members of Christ? Mm -hmm. Shall I take them away from the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot?" Mm. He says, "May it never be." Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. Hmm. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. And so the idea of a marriage, you know, that we're one spirit uh, with Almighty God. <laughs> you know, hmm. and in marriage, it's a total giving of both partners to each other. You know, nothing is held back. Nothing is reserved. It's, it's a total uh, giving of ourselves to each other. And so he said that that's like a marriage. Uh, he said, flee immorality. You know, the one who joins himself with a harlot is one with her. But you're joining yourself, uh, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And so you think of a marriage relationship where the husband is to protect and provide. And, you know, there's that just uh, that fellowship, that communion on every level. And God said, that's, that's an example of what I want with you. You know, you're the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom. Uh, and there's a total giving of themselves to each other. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So everything that Jesus has is, is yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's mine is yours. You know, just like in a marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, everything's owned own jointly. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So we have all of these analogies to try to get it through our thick heads. Yes. What is available for us? Wow. Point number C. A water baptism is a symbol of the new birth. A baptism in the Holy... S of course, water baptism uh, it symbolizes the, the removal of the old... The old man dies mm -hmm. in the resurrection of the new life uh, out of the water. The baptism, the Holy Spirit, this is an overwhelming of our inner personalities by the presence of God and the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he, gives, he comes with his power. He gives gifts for service. And his anointing is there. Uh, Acts 1 Four through eight. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Mm. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, 
It is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Yes, you shall receive power, authority. You know, and the, to me, the greatest power of the Holy Spirit is the, the power to say no Amen. to sin. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that inner, yes. inner power of the Holy Spirit to, wow. to make good choices, right choices. Yeah. The power to live a holy life. Mm -hmm. Because if the Holy Spirit is within and manifest in his life, the life is going to be holy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if the life is not holy, the Holy Spirit says, I'm, I do not dwell in unholy vessels. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that testimony that Carter Tomlin shared of that drug addict who was delivered from just a horrible habit, just the degradation and all that went to it? So he was at I don't remember this. I'll okay, anyway, he, he was given some money to go out and get something for the church. And there was the temptation. Mm -hmm. Just right, he knew all the druggies on the street. And they, mm -hmm. and he said he just stopped and he cried upon the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he passed through the temptation to victory. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. it, but it's Christ. Mm -hmm. It is. Yes, Fixing yes. your eyes on him yes, at every, mm -hmm. every temptation. Right. Mm -hmm. We have Matthew 3, 11, and 12. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, Hallelujah. whose fan Amen. is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So when it speaks of the Holy Spirit, water and fire are two symbols that are used. You know, the Holy Spirit and the fire. We believe in him from the innermost being, the rivers of living water. Uh, but both of those are symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Water, the idea of cleansing, purifying, purifying the heart, fire, um, again, it's also cleansing and purging, uh, like you refine gold in the fire. Uh, but the idea of doing away with the dross, but also the, the idea of empowerment, the fire of the Holy Spirit. D, there are various words describing the blessings of the Holy Spirit Christian relationship, uh, there is fellowship and direct access to the presence of God. We know Revelation 3.20 stands on the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come into him and have fellowship with him and he with me. And so that, that wonderful fellowship. Uh, knowledge is another word. Uh, to come to know by direct personal experience. It's not talking about head knowledge, but it's acquaintance. It's, it's the knowledge we gain by personal experience. Uh, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Then there's another Greek word that is translated to know thoroughly. A correct knowledge grounded in experience, Romans one twenty eight. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Yeah, they didn't see fit to acknowledge, or they, they didn't know him. They did not know God. Second uh, Peter 1, 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, 
through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Yes, through the knowledge, through that experiential knowledge, not from studying theology out of textbooks, but that experiential knowledge, that heart knowledge. Mm -hmm. But he said he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. All things. Plus some food in all things. All things. Everything. Yeah, everything we need. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, that's his promise. Mm -hmm. Everything we could possibly need. And it's through the knowledge of him that knowing Christ. Another word is to renew, renovate, restore, or to make new, Romans 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yes, by the renewing of your mind, renovating, renewing. And we do that, we renew our mind by... by getting into his word. That's what renews us. Uh, water is a type of refreshing in God. We've, we've read the John 7 many times. Out of our innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. So let's go to the John 4, verse 14. Okay. <clears throat> But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of spiritual satisfaction. He's conversing with the woman at the well. And of course, in her carnal mind, she said, well, man, I want this, because I don't want to come here every day and haul this water back home. But he had something so much more than just the physical water. He said, well, if you drink what I give you, it'll become within you a well of living water, springing up to eternal life. So I want to drink of that. <laughs> you know, and it changed her life. Point six, uh, full or be filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the, as the Spirit gave them utterance. In 4 verse 8, we'll ask. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, and then verse 31 of the same chapter, 4. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And so even in these three verses, we're seeing uh, repeat. Mm -hmm. You know, every time there's an opportunity for service, uh, they needed to again, mm -hmm. say, Lord, you know, it's your strength, not mine. You know, fill me with your Holy Spirit, a new and a fresh. I want, mm -hmm. I want I need your power in this situation. And our final, Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Yes, so that, that's actually a command. Or well, it's commanding us to, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because... We're the, he's the vine, we're the branches. We need that power, the life of Christ coming within if we're to bear the fruit of the Spirit and be productive in his kingdom. Uh, another word is power or ability. We know the Acts 1-8, they shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon them. We have 1 Thessalonians 1-5. Wait, relax. Thessalonians 1 5. Okay. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So the word came with power and a life to, to back it up, you know, a life that demonstrated a transformed character. 
And that, that's always the most powerful witness. You know, not just the words, but the life that, that gives evidence of the truth that the proclaimer is, is uh, delivering to the people. And that's, that's what was so true of Paul. He said, when I came to you, you know, I came in power, and I came with a life to back it up. Mm-hmm. Okay, fruit, point eight, fruit, this is an effect or result of, 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 being, of the Holy Spirit's work in our life, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Amen. John fifteen sixteen. <clears throat> you did not choose me, but I chose you and ordained appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. What a wonderful promise. Yes. Mm-hmm. I've chosen you to go forth and bear fruit, mm-hmm. and that your fruit will remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Isn't that? Mm-hmm. What's the limit to that? What's the limit to God? Right. You know, as long as with a pure heart for his Mm -hmm. purposes, for his glory, there's no limit. He takes ordinary people and they'll do extraordinary things. Yes. The comforter. He's a comforter or a helper. Uh, we've read the John 14, 16 many times, but when the Comforter comes, you know, he will lead, guide, and direct us into the truth. John 16, verse 7. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. To the comforter or helper. So that's, that's a wonderful expression, mm-hmm. comforter. You know, because there's times we definitely need the comfort of God. You know, when, when um, things happen and, you know, there's heartbreak and you know, the comforter is there. Wipes the tears from our eyes and strengthens us, you know, for these deep valleys that are part of life. He's our comforter. Mm-hmm. Ten, another word used is grieve and quench. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So don't grieve him. Don't do anything to cause him pain in his heart. And of course, the thing that would grieve him is if we would do something we know we shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. That would grieve him. How can you do that? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you said you gave your heart to Christ. You know, how, how could mm-hmm. you even think of doing something like that? See, and when he expresses his grief to us, that, that's an aid that helps mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. along the way. Because we have that intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, He'll express His grief, you know, and we'll know it in an instant. Mm-hmm. You know, like you testified, you woken up in the middle of the night. Yes. You know, you you felt he, he was grieved at something, and you pointed it out, and it was corrected. Mm-hmm. And so we can grieve the Holy Spirit, but Ephesians said, "Don't do that." First mm-hmm. Thessalonians five nineteen, quench not the Spirit. Now, Mark, you are a metal worker, and you know what quenching is. You know, when you get a piece of metal red hot, you know, and and put in water, that's called quenching. You know, something that's on fire, something that's red hot, you put it in the water, that quenches it. 
What what happens when you quench something? It changes it. Does it make it harder, more brittle, stronger? You know, when you quench. But it's it, it, they usually use it quenching as part of a hardening process, yeah, hardening, you know, when they make yeah, it it when they when they make metal. But as it pertains to us, you know, is speaking of those who are red hot for God, you know, and then take your life and, and quench it, put it in cold water, you know, and you lose your heat. Yeah, so that's what it's trying to convey. Don't quench the Holy Spirit, you know, because He wants us to be you know, radiant for God. And don't put a wet towel, you know, over the Holy Spirit in our life. Mm -hmm. Point five. Uh, there's words, analogies, and verb tense indicating the sudden nature of this transformation. And in the Greek, they call that the eris tense uh, that represents a, a climatic action. In other words, it's a definite action. In, in a period of time. And we've looked at many of these verses, but we'll go through these quickly. Um, saved, you know, that's a definite action. Uh, Titus 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Yes, two, to be born, born spiritually, John 3, 3, you must be born again. And again, mm -hmm. that error is tense, it means that it's a climatic action, a definite action. It's not a prolonged thing that's going to take you 10 years to mm -hmm. accomplish. Three, uh, born again or born from above, First Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And 23, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but that which is imperishable, that is, through the living an abiding word of God, the born again. And again, what Gordon Olson is saying is these words are in the Greek tense that means it's a climatic action. Mm -hmm. You know, not a prolonged, you know, action, but something that happens um, in a point in time. Uh, to bring forth James 1.18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Uh, made alive together with Ephesians 2 5. We were dead in our transgressions and sin, he made us alive together with Christ. Six, uh, created or transformed or completely changed, Ephesians 2 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. And the good works, you know, is not that he's got a specific item that you have to do every day of your life, but the good works, we walk in love. You know, we do what love demands in any situation. That's the good works he prepared for us. Works that come from a heart of love. Mm -hmm. uh, created, okay, put off. We put off the old manner of life, put on the new. Ephesians 4, 22-24. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Yes. And again, the idea of putting off a soiled garment and putting on one that's been freshly laundered, that's clean. Uh, to know thoroughly by experience, Colossians 1 6. Which is come unto you as it is in all the world, 
and brings forth fruit as it does also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. A nine to open the heart's door, and we know Revelation 3.20 that he knocks, and as an act of our will, we open. You know, and opening the door doesn't take three years. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, a climax. You just go over there and open it. Uh, passing from death to life, John 5.24. Verily, verily I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. I, I think this next heading, uh, B, where it says there are nine verbs in the aorist tense that stress the negative aspects of the transformation, the removal of something. I think we've looked these up, you know, in the past already, so I'm, we're just going to uh, say what they are. Uh, that when we come to the Christ, uh, we have died to sin. We live unto righteousness. And again, what... Olson is stressing that all of these words are in the, the tense that imply that it happens quickly, that it's a definite action. It's not a prolonged thing that takes forever. It's, it's, it comes to a climax and it's done. The error is tense. Uh, we're crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be done away with, that he was died as freed from sin. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. Not I who live, Christ lives in me. And so crucifixion took place at a definite point in time. With Christ and with us as well. Uh, set you free. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. You know, it doesn't take 20 years to be set free. It just takes the key in the lock and... A twist of the wrist and the chain is, is gone and you're set free. Uh, released, he released us, he loved us and released us by his blood. Five, washed. Uh, six, he's cleansed us to render fitter to qualify, uh, to render excellent or to make glorious. Uh, healed, by his stripes we're healed. So those words talk about what is removed. Then he's got 11 or 15 verbs in the aorist tense uh, that show the positive aspects, you know, something that we receive. Number one, we become partakers of the divine nature. Hallelujah. Partakers. And the essence of the divine nature, of course, is love. And he says, through his many and precious promises, by walking in obedience to him, we become partakers of the divine nature, having overcome the corruption that is in this world through lust. What a promise. Mm -hmm. Overcoming the corruption in this world through lust, or by lust. Two, we become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts 2 4 were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is poured out, fell upon. Again, the sudden action. Uh, did give the Holy Spirit, sent forth the Spirit into our hearts, baptized in the Holy Spirit, given to drink of the Holy Spirit, received the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit, sealed. Uh, the Holy Spirit's presence is the seal, clothed with power from on high, raised up together with Christ to partake of his resurrection life, sanctified or set apart um, or made holy by the life of the Spirit within us. Praise his name. Now, point number six. What is the evidence of this transformed life. The evidence of transformation is God's love and joy in our heart and a changed life. It's 
And that's how you know that you've truly been born again. You're going to have that deep inner joy and happiness and your life will change. Point A, another evidence. Uh, there is a direct witness of the Holy Spirit with our spirit. We will look these up. Acts 15, 8, and 9. And again, we're looking for evidence. How, how do we know? And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Yeah, so the evidence is a pure heart. The evidence is the Holy Spirit given to them. Romans 8, 15, and 16. For you, do, for you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again. But you have received the spirit of adoption adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The children heirs. So the direct witness of the Holy Spirit, there will be a heart, a warm-hearted love to God and to our fellow man. Romans 5.5 5. And hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Yes, and the Galatians is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. C, the Holy Spirit will choose to bestow miraculous gifts as he wills. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 7 through 11. But the manifest, manifestation of the Spirit has given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, hmm. to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these works that w that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Yes, yeah, so these wonderful gifts of the Spirit are made available to us. You know, they're, they're for us. They're, they're ours to, to embrace and he says uh, earlier in the cha chapter, you know, desire the spiritual gifts. Earnestly desire, you know, especially that you may prophesy. But just, you know, long for that. It's part of your inheritance. Mm -hmm. You know, and the Holy Spirit will give them to us um, as, as he sees fit and as the need arises. And like Tim says, it's not always something to carry around your back pocket. Mm -hmm. Because it's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit at that present moment, you know, when the need is there. You know, he'll impart you a gift of healing, a gift of faith, when it's needed mm -hmm. at that moment. So you'll be able to rise up and say, you know, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> That's a uh, be healed. Yeah. yeah, so that it's there, so expect it. You're a child of God. Expect this. It's the evidence of, of our new birth and our filling with the Holy Spirit. These gifts are available. And so step out and say, Lord, I'm your child. And there's often, you know, we need to pray for discernment. Lord, how do I handle this situation? Mm -hmm. You know, is that person, you know, operating in a good spirit or? <laughs> You know, because people can be so deceiving, so deceptive. We've been fooled more than once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. D, there will be a deep inner consciousness of being cleansed from sin and delivered from its power. 
deep in your conscience, you'll just feel clean. Mm -hmm. You know, the sin will be gone. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So to me, this is the main characteristic of being under grace. Mm -hmm. That if you're truly walking in the grace of God, sin will not be your master. It won't have dominion over you. You'll have dominion over it. If sin does have dominion over you, you're still under the law, under the condemnation. You know, mm -hmm. But if you're under grace, sin has no dominion. So this deep inner consciousness being forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So if all things become new in an individual's life, do you think they'll know it? <laughs> yes. Do you think we'll have to, to, to sit down with them and... and take them through 10 or 15 uh, verses on the assurance of their salvation. <laughs> They'll know it. They know it. You know, because the sin is gone. And they're a new creation. See, if, if you have to share, you know, convince somebody of the assurance of your, their salvation, you can be sure they don't have it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh. You can be sure they don't have it. And we really do people a misservice yes. when we try to give people the assurance of their salvation. Mm -hmm. Because that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we're taking the work of the Holy Spirit in our hands because the Spirit himself will bear witness with our spirit mm -hmm. that we're children of God. And so if we try to convince somebody well, you're a Christian now. I heard you pray the sinner's prayer. Yeah. Now, you said it says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord, I heard you confess. But I don't feel saved. You know, and then, mm -hmm. well, the Bible says, uh, you know, if you received him, you know, and, and you're arguing with a guy trying to, mm -hmm. you know, convince him or lead him to the assurance mm -hmm. of his salvation. And you're taking away the work of the Holy Spirit. See, so if he doesn't have it, the Spirit is working with him, trying to, to bring him to that place of repentance. And when he does repent, the Spirit will bear witness with him. And he'll know him because sin will be gone. You know, clean conscience, peace of God will fill his heart. He'll be overflowing with joy. Be jumping up and down and dancing in the aisles. Mm -hmm. uh, and more than that, yeah. Peter, the word of God will open to them because yes. the spirit of truth will yes. now lead them, guide them, and oh, teach them all truth. Oh. And that was something that I experienced was I did I wasn't taught no follow up, but the Spirit of God is faithful. And I would read the Bible, and I started understanding it, and I thought, yeah, that is what I experienced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit, and it if is. you don't have that, the book remains closed. It's so it does. Yes. It, it is? Yes. Yeah. All of a sudden, you can understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something changed. And you desire it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. We're looking at evidence of the transformed life. Mm -hmm. uh, e, victory over sin is... Predominant will be the predominant characteristic of your life. Lapses into sin would be the exception. We yes. still are free will moral agents, mm -hmm. but the longer we go on with the Lord, you know, the the less uh, we will we will slip up and fall. Yes. And He wants to get us to a place where we're walking before Him, you know, with a pure heart. And the, the, the lapses become less and less the more and more we know him. Because we'll experience the grief, you know, and we've seen the cross. We've understood the broken heart of God. And so we, we just make up our mind that by the power of God, we're done. We're done with sin forever. Peter, I just see something that I've never seen before. 
and that is if the church is giving them a false a false hope and and they're really not breaking through you're teaching them to lie to live a lie and if it doesn't work nothing works it's a terrible thing to do to it, is. A person. it is it is right. we're we're it is we're taking away the you know we're trying to do the work of the holy spirit but you're teaching the, the so-called new believer to, be, to lie against the truth if he's not converted. Mm -hmm. Declaring it, decreeing it, speaking it yeah. is still not, it has to it's be a not reality. a reality. Yeah. It's yeah. a lie. It and you're putting them in grave danger. It yeah. is. It's eternal danger. Yes, because now they're in the church and they assume and they that, think, mm -hmm. you know, sin is no part of the Christian life and you know, after all everybody else does, and, you know, I not hear anything different from the pulpit. I just think we could have done that with you when you were, when you were first coming to the Lord, and you kept saying that, you know, yeah. I'm not saved, right. you know. You know, and, you know, there's many verses yeah. that they could use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um Case of the substance of things hoped for. Right. Yeah. Things you know, and are you calling God a liar? Right. Because, uh, you know, he said that if you do this, um, wow. this this will happen. Are you mm -hmm. calling God a liar? You know, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. But yet the reality wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But you can't fake this victory over sin. <laughs> that cannot be faked. Uh, Romans 6 verse 2 and verse 14. God forbid. <clears throat> How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Yeah, and the question Paul asks, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? And his answer is, he almost throws up <laughs> at even the suggestion. God forbid. <laughs> How shall we who have died to sin still live any longer in it? Now, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Yes. In 2 Corinthians 5, no, I'm sorry, we read that. Galatians 5.16. Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Very plain verse, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Walk by the Spirit and you shall not. That sounds pretty strong word. Shall not. Mm -hmm. Can I share a testimony? Yes. When I was converted in 1972, Mother's Day, um, I decided I wasn't going to tell anybody what happened to me. Because I didn't know how to explain it. But I thought, well, if if it's the reality, if what I'm feeling is a reality, I'm going to let them see it. <laughs> it was the greatest blessing when, as I didn't tell my parents, and I didn't, you know, I just didn't know what to say what happened to me. I, I didn't know how to define it. But um, the day came when my dad was taking me somewhere to catch a ride back to school or somewhere. And it was a, just a great blessing to me because we were alone, to say, hear him ask me, what happened to you? <laughs> I used to be door slammer, a uh, fighter, <laughs> you know, and now I was going out, I, I couldn't wait to help my parents. It was the first time I submitted to them wow. after yeah. I was converted. I mean, it was a joy to do it, but before that, it was always, a, mm -hmm. it was just, a, mm -hmm. I want to do my own thing, mm -hmm. but now it was, I want to do God's mm -hmm. God's will. Oh, so it was, it was a, I knew that when my dad said that, that there was something that they could, they saw that changed and something truly was working mm -hmm. in me that was other, otherwise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Wow. You know, and with this victory over sin, which is your birthright, um, you know, that, that's for us. That, that's part of the Christian life. He wants us to walk in victory over sin. But you'll hear it said from some pulpits, 
you know, if you proclaim that you're walking before God in holiness, that that's the essence of pride. Mm. Have you ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I've heard that from mm -hmm. pulpits. Mm -hmm. You know, that if you, you know, suggest at all uh, that you have victory over sin, that, well, I'm sorry, you know, your pride is showing right there. And so that there will also be a humility that comes with the victory over sin. Yeah. But it but it's mandatory. It's real. And the power is there. The provision is there. And so if it's there, if it's what Jesus died for, why in the world wouldn't we embrace it? He came to set his people free from their sins. From their sins. Amen. And their religion wants in a, in their sins. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the a characteristic that that lapses will be the exception. We still have a free will, mm -hmm. but as we fall more and more in love with God, we should be sinning less and less as time goes on. Amen. And I'm convinced that we need to come to a place in our life at some point where we say, "I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done." Lord, by your grace, with your strength, by your help, I don't ever want to sin again for the rest of my life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sooner the better. Yeah, and the sooner you make that decision, the better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Daniel did as a young boy. Mm -hmm. When he was nine years old, Daniel. said he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. Yeah, I just love that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, his thing dealt with food, but I believe that was a decision that stayed with him the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Lord, by your grace, I will not defile myself. Mm -hmm. And that's why God so raised beautiful. him up and used him so greatly. And now when he's an old man, 80-some years old, faced with the lion's den decision, he knowingly and willingly says, Lord, I'm not going to defile myself. I haven't all the rest of my life. They throw me to the lions. Mm -hmm. That's a, in your hands, but I will not defile myself. So he he had made that choice, and yeah. so had his three friends, mm -hmm. because they were confronted with uh, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had built, mm -hmm. and he said, "When you hear the music, you bow down before this idol." Mm -hmm. And they didn't do it, and he gave them a second chance. And he warned, the king warned him, and their reply to the king essentially was, King, we'd rather die than sin. We'd rather die than sin. You know, and our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, be it known to thee, O king, we will not bow to your idol. See, because that was in their heart. I'd rather die than sin. Mm -hmm. And they did it without the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, I was just thinking if one little diversion from his his face that was set as a flint on honoring this God, the tr only true God, it would if one diversion would have put him into the clutches of Satan and there could have never been a recovery. He would have... You think of it, what could have been would not have ever been accomplished. That's the what sin does. What could have been never will be. Mm. That's the that's the call to a holy life. Yes. You'll never know the victories if you don't make the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm. Amen. Mm. So again, yes. the evidence. How do we know that we've passed from death to life? Mm -hmm. One of the evidences will be that sin will be... Um, very uncommon. Point number F, there will be an enlargement in the knowledge of the being of God and of truth. We've done the John 17, 3. Uh, this is life eternal, to know God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Yes, yeah, so we're the day there's going to be that divine illumination. We're going to have understanding and wisdom. G, 
The Holy Spirit brings great rejoicing. And that's only the beginning. It'll go on for eternity. The Acts 8 is the um, Philippian, not the Philippian jailer, but the um, Ethiopian eunuch. Mm. You know, after he was saved and baptized, he went on his way rejoicing. Mm. Uh, Acts 15.32 And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. I'm not sure that's Excellent. the verse I'm looking for. Acts 15.32. It is, that's the right uh -huh. verse, but I may have made a mistake in putting it down there. But I, I think, w I was thinking of the Philippian jailer incident where even though they were beaten and so on and so forth, they, they were just singing and praising God mm -hmm. at midnight. That might be the Acts 16.34. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So that was the Philippian jailer. Mm -hmm. But even Paul and Silas in jail were, were joyful. Mm -hmm. You know, and singing praises to God at midnight. And that joy spilled over onto the jailer. Uh, the transformed life is an emergence into divine fellowship from the state of death. Pass on from death to life. And so the final point that he makes in, in this particular lesson, he looks back to nature, where here in northern Michigan we have the monarch butterfly. They fly up from Mexico. The mothers lay an egg on the milkweed plant. Mm -hmm. Mother dies. The egg hatches into a little worm that goes around, eats the leaf of the milkweed plant, and after they grow big and fat over a period of time, they weave for themselves a pupa and lie dormant for a while, for about two weeks, and then out emerges a new creature. Same genetic material, but a brand new creature. Now you have a creature capable of soaring and flying in a, in a different dimension, no longer earthbound. You know, it can soar to the heavens. And how can that worm turn into something with the wings? Very fragile thing with those scales. Mm. And how can a sinner turn into a saint? Yeah. It's the same, it's the same question. Both frogs and butterflies. Yeah, so, so that's an illustration from nature of what Christ wants to do in our life. To, to enable us to soar. Or before we just groveled in the in the dust of this earth, and now we can soar in victory before our Lord. Father, thank you for this lesson. Thank you, O Lord, and help us to apply these things to our hearts and lives. Father, I thank you for the wonderful promise that eye has not seen and ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into the mind of man. But you said all of that. And even more, you have prepared for those who love you. And so, Father, I pray that you would lift us up in our understanding so that we would not be like that spiritual pauper that we talked about that was just eating cheese and crackers and, and, and struggling and, and just so hungry, but, but that we would feast at the abundant table that you have set before us, even in the presence of our enemies, Lord, there's a table. And Father, we want to be partakers of everything that you have for us. Lord, not, not the smorgasbord where we're going to choose not to partake of certain things. But Father, we want everything that you have available for us. And so Father, in the days to come, give us wisdom and understanding. Open our eyes. Increase our faith that we may by faith, um, lay hold of these precious and wonderful promises of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.